So paired with the first scripture lesson, which spoke about a widow and the prophet Elijah, is another story about another widow. This comes to us from Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. Listen for God's word today. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury, and with the disciples watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums, but a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. And then Jesus called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty. She has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I mentioned earlier, a tritone interval is dissonant. It's hard to hear, and it's an interval that is full of tension. As such, in many ways, it's the perfect symbol for the season in which we find ourselves. Because every day we move around in the world, and if we're honest, we all feel tense. Now, much of that is still tied to COVID. The questions abound, are my friends vaccinated or not? Are the numbers going up and down? Will my young child be okay? But the tensions are not just tied to COVID. As we know, there are political tensions, Republican versus Democrat, progressive versus moderate. There are work tensions, Should I go into work or should I somehow try to do my tasks remotely? And as always, there are money tensions. Do I have enough money? The holidays are coming up. Can I pay the credit card bills and the rent? And it's Stewardship Sunday at church on top of all this. So tensions are there. Tensions are everywhere. And it's as if, in many ways, the soundtrack of our life is built around the interval of a tritone. Now, Jesus was no stranger to tension. By the time we hear this gospel lesson today, Jesus has already paraded into the capital city of Jerusalem on Palm, si- on Palm Sunday. He embodied the tension between the contrast of a Roman army and general on a white stallion war horse and then this humble rabbi who came into the city walls riding a donkey. And now he and his disciples are sitting in the outer court of the temple, and they happen to be watching the people go by, a bit awestruck as they see scribes and religious officials in expensive robes empty their money pouches into the 13 different boxes to which people gave their tithes and donations to the temple. And as they watched the people do this, Jesus whispered to the disciples, beware of those who like to walk around in robes and be greeted with respect, yet who devour the savings of the poor. They will be condemned. The disciples, again, not from Jerusalem in many cases, they come from the rural areas, so they were awestruck at this amazing structure with its huge stones But their reverie was broken when Jesus leaned into them and said, Do you see these great buildings? I tell you, soon not one stone will be left upon another, and all will be thrown down. So there's a tension here, like a tritone, a dissonance. And it leaves us with the question, how can all of this somehow be resolved? Now, while Jesus was watching, while they were seated there in the temple, a poor woman approached the money boxes. And from the humbleness of her gesture, it became clear to those watching that she was dropping the smallest of gifts into the box, perhaps a couple of pennies. She didn't wear fancy robes. There was no hint of vanity or ostentation in any of her gestures. Her simple act was noted by Jesus though. And so Jesus points her out to the disciples. And that one 
anecdote has launched 100,000 sermons, most of them on this Sunday. Because in effect, it sounds like, and Jesus does say, behold the poor widow, the woman who gave of everything she had, all that she had to live on. And the message is that, well, then that's what we should do. And if for some reason that doesn't sink in, well, we have ushers with plates to make sure the message sinks in. But then the woman disappears. She vanishes into the crowd after giving her modest offering. And the reality is that the tritone dissonance of her gift and the other gifts and the question of our own gifts, that dissonance lingers. Now, many preachers will hold up the widow as an example that we should emulate because of her sacrificial giving, that nothing was held back, all was given. But ministers need to always be careful about asking those who already give the most that they now should give more. It is unfair to put pressure upon those already cast in society's servant roles And far too often that means women or people of color or migrants. And then somehow put the burden on them that they should surrender even more of their resources. While others can simply write checks from the frothy excess of their personal investments. It is unfair to tax things like food and gas. But leave relatively untouched the capital gains that come from mutual funds. And if we're being totally honest, is it right to demand sacrificial offerings to be given to the church when over its history, the institution has a a flawed history of valorizing war, of excluding women and people of color and gays and lesbians from leadership, and oftentimes using the pulpit to, to lift up and excuse racism? and xenophobia, and capitalism. Tensions abound, and they don't go away just by noticing a poor widow who puts two coins into the offering plate. Now, we need to be honest that tensions are part of all of our lives. I mentioned that Leonard Bernstein used the tritone interval to symbolize the tension at the heart of the entire musical of West Side Story, this modern retelling of Romeo and Juliet. The tritone is there when Riff tells the gang members to not attack one another, but to stay cool for the moment. It's there when Tony meets Maria, but can't imagine any way their warring families would let them be together. And the tritones there when the gangs lay down their weapons as they stand around Tony's body. But the tension remains, even as it had cost Tony his life. And as Christians, we gather in this space and we tell a story that is also built around tensions, opposites that clash and cannot be ignored. A Messiah king rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. A humble rabbi from the outskirts of the kingdom confounds the religious authorities with their power. This young Galilean Jesus is going to stand with bound arms as a prisoner in front of the thrones of Rome, of Herod and Pilate. And this giver of life, this prince of peace, will die a violent death on a wooden cross, a crucifixion designed as a cautionary tale that anyone who thinks that following this Jesus will resolve their life's tensions is mistaken. Tension is a part of my life. I'm sure it's a part of your life as well. So if we seek to resolve the tension, it's wise again to listen to Jesus as he points to that widow who leaves her humble offering in the temple that day. So first, Jesus intentionally told the disciples to look at her, to see her, to take note of what she had done. Living in a world of tensions requires that we first see what is right in front of us, that we see the ones we're quick to overlook or ignore. 
Jesus knew that the first step in resolving tensions is to notice the blind man or the beggar who's longing to be made whole, the tax collector who's hanging in the branches of the sycamore tree, praying at some point to once more be the guest of the community, or the little child who others tried to push away, but Jesus invited forward and said, of such is the kingdom of God, as well as the man locked behind bars, caught in an unjust criminal justice system, or the young woman vulnerable to violence and sex trafficking simply because of her gender. Nothing gets better. No tension can be resolved until we first look around and notice. But then second, Jesus wants us to see that the woman made the gift publicly. She stepped up to the treasury boxes there in the wall just the exact same way that the wealthy scribes had done it before her. But she moved into this place associated with power and prestige, but she did a humble act for all to see from her heart. We want to call back from our own American history. Back in 1797, Many people were clamoring for George Washington to agree to a third term of office, but he refused to do so. As important as it was for him to accept the mantle as the first president of the United States, he knew it was more important for him to step down after two terms and to publicly relinquish that mantle. What Washington did was he gifted our entire nation the example of a peaceful transfer of power that no mob or misrule can challenge. Tensions only are resolved when we publicly model what is right for all to see. Third, despite all the tensions and In today's world, the media's fixation on everything that's broken around us, there are good things happening here in our church, here in our community, here in the world. Nicholas Kristof is a well-known columnist for the New York Times. He's stepping down from that role, actually, to run for governor of his home state of Oregon. Now, Kristof normally writes from some of the worst places in the world, some of the grimmest scenarios of genocide and poverty. But he also finds time in his columns to lift up the ways life is getting better. In his last column in the paper, He reminds us that even during the COVID pandemic, every day, thousands and thousands of people are being lifted out of poverty. Hundreds of thousands are getting electricity for the very first time or access to clean drinking water. In the United States, programs are finding housing options for homeless veterans. And for, for the current rate of teenage pregnancies, It is down 73% from where it was 30 years ago. Jesus took time to point out the widow and her humble offering as a reminder that good exists in the world, that small deeds of kindness abound, and that everything, everything we do has a consequence, especially those things that are good and generous. And so, yes, there are reasons to keep on keeping on. And lastly, what that widow did on that day was an act of faithful trust. Now, her pennies did not move the temple budget from loss to surplus, but they were a living witness of trust, of gratitude, of generosity, and that That was far more valuable. In a little while, we will receive pledge cards, commitments to the year's budget ahead. And we'll also receive food donations in our annual chaotic circus of giving, of bringing down bags and hoping that cans of corn don't roll under the pews. 
Now we could probably do this much better or much more efficiently. We could simply have you do it online or we could just write a big check from our endowment to the food bank. But we do it this way each year because it's a public act, a public act of humility, of praise, of trust, of generosity. And then when that's all finished, you will come forward a second time to gather at the communion table. And you do it not because you've earned it, not because you want to show off your robes and finery, but you do it as a simple act of trust and gratitude. God loved us enough to come into this world as a son, a savior. Christ loved us enough to be a public witness of faith and hope in a world that would choose to hurt and try to destroy him. The Spirit of God moved at the first creation and then moved again at Easter, the recreation to show that the tensions of life are not the final word of life. There is resurrection. There is hope. There is something deeper that we can trust and ever believe in. And so that's why Jesus wants us to see the widow He wants us to be inspired by her public witness. He wants us to do our own part by doing what is good and compassionate and righteous and then make our lives, yes, our financial lives, to make them always be guided by a trust and a heartfelt gratitude. And tensions will remain as long as you live and breathe. That is a fact. But rejoice, to paraphrase one of the comments Jesus himself said, in this world you will know tension, you will hear tritones, but be not afraid, for I have overcome the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.